Then sings my soul, how great you are. What a great God we serve. Awesome God. Full of wonder, full of power. How great you are, Lord. We stand in awe of you, Lord. We stand and we sit in awe of you and all that you do and all that you've done in our lives. And we want to thank you, Lord, that you're a God who loves us, cares for us and knows us. And Father, as we come before you right now, we know that many come with burdens and disappointments and hurts. And you've come to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free, Lord. I'm asking you this morning as we come before you, would you move amongst us mightily and set the captives free, bind up the brokenhearted, heal the sick. Lord, we think of many at this moment who are sick and we as we think of them in our thoughts and our minds, we bring them before you and we say, come, Holy Spirit, heal and restore those people right now. Come and heal those people right now. As we think of them right now, heal them. And we name them in our minds to you, Lord. We, we claim victory over their sickness and their their infir infirmities, Lord. Come and heal. Come and heal, Lord. Come and heal. Lord, we just pray right now for the government and authority over us. Let your will be done in Froome in this area as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom reign over this country, Lord. Lord, we're, we're asking revival to come into this country of ours. That we will see a turning of people to you, the way, the truth, and the life. And so, Lord, we're just asking right now that you would just bring revival to our nation, to our towns. Bring revival, Lord, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Revival, Lord. Revival is what we want. Whoa, revival is what we want. I've got to apologize. Hi, Zoom. Who's on Zoom? I didn't thank you. Mind me at the beginning. But lovely to have you with us. And welcome, James. Let's just pray for him as he comes up. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Let's just pray right now. Father, we just thank you for the word that James has brought to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've inspired him. We ask you that you would help him in all that he does and all that he says, that your name will be glorified and honoured. Holy Spirit, come and fill him with your presence right now. Fill him right now from the top of his head to the tip of his toes right now. That you will fill your anointing on him as he speaks in jesus name amen. amen 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 thank you so much for having me today honestly it's, it's lovely lovely to be here good morning that was pretty good actually i'm used to doing like kids church at trinity every sunday and it's always a big good morning like, oh, good morning yeah <laughs> go away that was pretty good good morning um it's amazing 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 to be here i think the kids deserve a little round of applause because they have been so engaged and they've sat there. And I remember when I was a little boy and my mum took me to church, I stared at the ceiling. That's all I did for about an hour. I stared at the ceiling 
and I kept thinking it was uh, like a, a boat or something like that upside down. Anyway, a bit random. So um, originally, I was going to talk about the conversion of Saul. And then I was thinking, oh, you know what, I wonder if I should talk about Gideon's army. And then I was going to talk about Zephaniah 3, when Israel is restored and, and the Lord rejoices over him. But actually, what I'm going to talk about is none of those things, but there is a central <laughs> link. And it's the story of uh, King Jehoshaphat from 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 20, if you've got a Bible. It's, it's, it's a whole chapter. We're going to read it. I don't want to see any eye rolling. I know what it's like sometimes. You're in church. You think someone's going to waffle on and waffle on and waffle on. But you're coming to church, you're getting some scripture. It's like going to a, a bakery and complaining about too much cake, you know? It's good, it's good, it's good for us. So um, we're going to read this, and I've, I've got a few little bits to, to share along the way, I think. So it's 2 Chronicles 20. If you haven't got a Bible with you, bring your Bibles, or bring your phones, or bring your iPads. There's no, I'm not judging you, I'm terrible at doing this myself, but you never know when it's going to come in handy. So Jehoshaphat defeats Moab and Ammon. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Mennonites, came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazim Tamar, that is, En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. What was their first thought when an army was coming towards them? To inquire of the Lord and proclaim a fast for all of Judah. What is your first thought when trials and difficulties and worries come your way? I know mine. It's to stress about it, to run. Yeah, definitely to run. To worry about it and then maybe invite the Lord in on the side and say, God, could you help me with this? But the first thing he does, not the thing that he does after a few days, the first thing he does, he inquires of the Lord and said, Lord, what are you up to here? And, and, and Judah was, was a big kingdom, you know. It was a big kingdom. And people came from all the towns and the villages that were mainly unfortified, unfortified quite sparsely populated, they came together and they prayed and they inquired of the Lord. Hello, Ezra, saying Dada in the back, sorry. But can you imagine if a call went out to the whole of Somerset and people came from Watchit and from Minehead and from South Somerset and from Taunton and from everywhere and we met in Shepton Mallet Village Hall, a town hall, and we prayed and we inquired of the Lord. It's, it's unthinkable. It's not what we see in our culture. But when trials and difficulties come our way, let's inquire of the Lord. We're going to push on. From verse 4. The people of Judah came together to seek him, uh, came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood, stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can, stand, can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it, give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They've lived in it and have built, it, built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name. And we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. In their pray, what is the first thing that they do? When they pray, what is the first thing that they do? They call out to God. They remind God who he is. They say, power is in your hands. You rule over the nations. Look at what you've done before, etc., etc., etc. When we pray, what do we tend to start with? Anyone? Definitely, we start with the, the situations that we see. And I certainly start a lot of the time saying, oh Lord, help me with X, Y, or Z. I lift up this person, this situation. But maybe, maybe we should always aim to start our prayer with God, this is who you are. 
this is why we worship you. This is what we've, you've done in our lives. This is what we read in the scripture. Jehoshaphat's still praying. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of our possession that you gave us as our inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. All of the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jael, the son of uh, Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The Spirit says to him, the battle is not yours, but God's. How often do we try and fight battles in our own strength, with our own ideas, with our own creativity? How often do we say, this God is your battle? And I think that poses a bigger question for us as, as the church re-emerges out of COVID here at, at Froome Christian Fellowship, across Froome, all the different denominations, and then also nationwide, we need to rethink and perhaps refocus on God and say, Lord, what do you want church to look like? What do you want the circumstances that we find ourselves in to look like? We need to reassess, refocus, because he is the one in authority. He is the one who can dictate what circumstances happen, what the outcomes are. It says in scripture, as we all know, the battle is not with flesh and blood but it's in the spirit against powers and principalities. We press on. Verse 16. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeriel. You will, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Go out tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. What do you see when you look at the church? What, what characteristics do you see? Not from this church necessarily, but from the churches around you, in your communities, in your villages, in your, in your streets. What kind of characteristics do you see? Has anyone got any, anything they could throw out? rather hiding. Hiding? I, I think, as I look at the church, one of the key things that I see is discouragement. There's fear, most definitely, but there's people that really want to see transformation. They want to see, see situations change, but people are discouraged because they haven't seen it or because life's become difficult or whatever, whatever's gone on. People aren't necessarily seeing the stuff that might excite us when we read things that Jesus did or we read the book of Acts and what was going on in the New Testament. They're not necessarily seeing it in the everyday. And so they become discouraged. But we read here when the Spirit comes and speaks to this group of people, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Now it's hard. I know it's hard. And I, I, for about two months I've been... Um, I've been feeling lightheaded and I've been dizzy and I've been miserable, really miserable. And I would say I've been discouraged. But when you come back and you read the word or you come and you come spend time in the Lord's presence, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. God speaks to us, reinvigorates us. The other thing I'd say is that fear that Anne mentioned. Fear of, of, of being alone. Fear of not being good enough fear of financial hardship, whatever insecurities that people have, the devil loves to play on it and bring out those fears. He loves for us to feel isolated, insecure and discouraged. But all we need, all we need is the Lord with us because when the Lord is with, with us, things change. Let's read on. 
Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohatites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Amen. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. As they begin to praise, things change. We've touched on already what we tend to do when we come into a place of prayer. Perhaps praise is the key. I've been... Um, I love music, all types of music, probably too much music for my wife's liking going on in the house, really. But I've been intentionally trying to listen to more worship music in my everyday because when you listen to worship music, it changes your perspective. It changes what you're thinking about. It changes what, what, you, what you remember from the, the Bible that you might have read. It changes what you might think about from someone, something that was shared on Sunday. So definitely, I think it changes us, and I hope you've experienced that too. But what, what if it changes the situations that we find ourselves in as well. What if praise is one of the weapons that we have to see change in this society, to see change in this world, not just internally, but in our communities? Let's read on. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they only saw dead bodies lying on the ground and no one had, had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off the plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. So much plunder, it, takes three days to, it took three days to collect it. Blessing comes from obedience. The story of King Jehoshaphat is not only that he seek the Lord and said, Lord, what are you up to? He went to inquire of the Lord. He then listened and waited and a prophet spoke into that situation. But then, and this is the tricky bit for all of us, he was obedient to it. We can read scripture all of the time. We can hear things spoken about in church or in, in small groups or wherever it may be. God might say something through his presence to you. But being obedient is tricky. But King Jehoshaphat was obedient. And, and, and the blessing there came from his obedience. Uh, I always remember uh, listening to a preacher growing up who said that when he felt sick, he used to go out and pray for the sick on the streets. Now, I don't know if the theology is right there, but back in Deuteronomy 20, 28, there's a whole list of things that God says he will bless, from your, from your kneading your dough through to your womb to your livestock if you are obedient and follow his commands. And I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about that earthly blessing, although God, as we know, cares deeply for our needs, but blessing which comes with the fruit of the Spirit, which is, anyone want to read them out? What are the fruits of the Spirit? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll read them out in case you couldn't hear. But yeah, I think we probably got, we got them all. But love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we're obedient in our discipleship, we see the blessing from God. It's like I've got a t we've got two rabbits in our house. In our house? They're not in our house, I should clarify. They were going to be in our house. I don't know if you've ever had rabbits. They are the most infuriating creatures in the world. I think probably second only to goats. 
because they just kill and chew, not kill, but chew everything that tries to grow up. They kill all the plants you're trying to grow, all the vegetables you're trying to grow. They'll go for the strawberry patch, you put chicken wire up, they'll get through the chicken wire. I don't know how it happens, they are infuriating. So I built a planter. Rabbits can't get to the vegetables. But if I don't water the vegetables, they wither and die. Obedience is part of our discipleship. I really think that, you know, uh, there are three kind of things, include, uh, not including obedience, that lead to us being healthy and encouraged followers of Jesus. One is reading the scripture, really getting into it. And I, I feel I'm bad at saying that. I can say that. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. Read the scripture. Second thing, spend time in his presence. Say, come Holy Spirit. I know Jeff said at the beginning, come Holy Spirit. Let us see revival, let us see transformation, but come Holy Spirit. Third thing, community. And it seems, and I've only just been here this morning, sadly, but there's an amazing little community where you pray for each other, you encourage one another, you love one another. And the fourth thing, I think, is obedience. Because we can have all of those things. We can go along to, to small groups or come on a Sunday morning or, or, or read the Bible or, or say, God, come Holy Spirit, speak to me. Would you guide me? Would you give me a picture or a word or whatever? But if we, don't, if we haven't got obedience, we won't see transformation in our lives. We won't see that change. We read on. Verse 26. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day, because Baraka means praise. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. The fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the counties where they, heard, where they had heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Amazing story, no? I think it's the most remarkable story. And I always, I'm being honest here, and vulnerable, I always lean away from reading the Old Testament. I read the Psalms, I read the New Testament, I'll read Paul's letters, but I don't know why, I just think, oh, it's going to be hard going if I read the Old Testament. But there's so much good stuff in the Old Testament for us to, to take. So initially, as I said, I thought this talk was about the power of praise. But I think actually on reflection, as I thought about all the things I could talk about, from Gideon's army to, to Saul's conversion, it's about obedience. As I realised, I slowly realised that what I should share is really about Jehoshaphat's obedience. I felt terribly, 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 terribly underqualified because I'm not obedient. I often don't make time to read his word, to, to spend time in prayer. Sometimes I think God says something and I don't get around to doing it or it drops off the to-do list. And especially if you, you work for a church as well, you're just busy doing stuff. Whether it's the stuff that God wants you to do might be another question, but you're busy doing stuff. But I'm going to share a time that I, I, I was obedient and what happened. And um, it was about 10 years ago. I was, uh, I'd, I'd finished school. I was working in Tesco's and I had no idea what I wanted to do. No idea. Um... I had a couple of friends who had recently, recently come to faith and they'd booked to go to New Zealand. And um, they booked the camper van, came back as a confirmation for three people. They booked the ferry across from North Island to South Island, came back as confirmation for three people. Again and again, they were finding these things that they were booking for this trip to New Zealand were coming back for three people. And they, they were new to faith, so they got together and they prayed and they, they came to me after, after a shift one day at work uh, we're having a, having a drink and they said oh do you want to come to New Zealand and I said well it beats stacking shelves at Tesco I'd imagine so yeah I'll come to New Zealand anyway went out there for two months and um, first first Sunday we got there we always thought we'd, we'd have a walk around the town on a Saturday have a little pray see God is there a church we should go to first Sunday we got there um, church about 150 people Pastor invites us to the front and says, can you pray for our church? And we thought, oh, that's a bit weird, really. But yeah, we'll pray for you. Again and again, we go to a church. Something really odd would happen. They'd ask us to pray. You know, I don't know what it's like here. Maybe you might ask someone who wanders in off the street to come and, and pray. 
and, and, and prophesy, whatever. Anyway, halfway through the trip, my, one of my friends had a terrible, terrible back pain, old sports injury, and uh, we were praying for him, and um, just praying for healing, really, to come to his back, because sleeping in a camper van or a tent is not ideal for a bad back, obviously. Anyway, as I was praying for him, another friend of mine says, um, guys, I really think the Lord's just said to me that we should drive up to Picton um, tomorrow and we should pray for backs, for shoulders and for necks. And we said, are you sure God said that? Because here we are, halfway down South Island, kind of wanted to go to Mount Cook. I kind of wanted to see the glaciers. I, you know, why would we go to Picton, which is, is like a small ferry port at the top. Is It's where you go from Picton up to Wellington on North Island. All it is is a ferry town, really. But anyway, we said, if you're sure, we'll do it. So we drove up to Pic Picton the next day, slightly reluctantly, to be honest with you, because if you're in New Zealand, you want to see the most incredible places. And um, we parked up the camper van, had a little wander around the town, wander up past this church. It's full of people. And a um, man runs out, and a lady runs out. The lady is dressed head to toe, in, in dark clothing. Um, and the pastor introduced himself and says, um, we've got a weekend on the prophetic and hearing the voice of God. Do you want to come in? Starting then. It was coffee break, I think, coffee introduction. So we went in. And um, long story short, we shared why we, why we turned up in Picton. And that weekend, we were there for three days in the end. We saw 44, 45 healings of people. We'd walk into a shop, a chap who, who owned a DIY shop in the town ran out and said, are you the bloke from England? Will you pray for me? I've got terrible neck pain. We saw physical healing after physical healing after physical healing. All because we showed up, really. Nothing to do with us. Three blokes knew nothing. Nothing. But the most incredible thing was, was that the uh, day we left, we got invited to a, a, a chap's house to do some work on a farm um, in North Island. So the day we were leaving, um, early the next week, the woman who had run out dressed all in black said, I just want to say that this weekend, God has touched my life. I'm in a very difficult situation at home with my husband. There's a lot of domestic abuse in, in, in New Zealand in particular. My sons treat me like rubbish. But this weekend, God has healed me. I, I know, and she was dressed completely differently. Her whole demeanour was changed. And in some ways, it was more beautiful than all the physical healings because you'd seen the work of God in her life. And we came home and thought, okay, well, we, we need to do some ministry, really. What's the point in working in Tesco's when you can you do, do things for the Lord? And as I say, I'm not great at obedience, but three blokes in a camper van with a Bible and a bit of openness can see lives transformed. I wonder what we could see in our everyday. Would we see that healing? Would we see salvation? Would we see the kingdom coming and transforming lives, communities and spaces in ways that we could only even imagine? Would we see people having dreams and being inspired if we were obedient and we would pray? We read in Luke's Gospel that when the 72 disciples returned after Jesus had sent them out, they returned with joy. And they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. When was the last time that you entered his presence with joy and amazement at what he has done? I know that all too often I'm not obedient. But maybe if I was, we'd see more transformation. More people lifted out of poverty, more healing, more salvation more of God's love shared on earth. And that's kind of all I wanted to say today, Jeff. Mm, that's good. Should we just spend a few minutes just waiting on the presence of the Lord and just say, Lord, is there anything in any way I can be obedient to you today? So, yeah, Father, I just thank you for this amazing group of brothers and sisters here in the fellowship. I thank you that your presence is among us and with us. Would you open our hearts and our minds? And would we be open, Lord, to you challenging us on how we can live or speak or act that we might see 
more of your kingdom here on earth. Thank you, Father, for that incredible story in in 2 Chronicles there. Father, I just pray that you would inspire us, not today, but every day, that we might live for you. that we might see communities and society transformed by your power. And may you show us and encourage us and guide us into how we can play our part in that. From from speaking to our lovely neighbours, to living a life that follows you, that's obedient to you. I thank you for your love. Amen. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, James. Just to remind you that uh, Wednesday we have Anne taking the Bible study. Next Sunday we'll be here as usual. Let's see what God's doing with us. Don't be shy with what God's got for us. Let's be obedient to what he is telling us to do as a fellowship, and as a church in the town, and whatever God's got for us. Amen.